increasingly we're in a generation where people have an opinion about our lives and how we're living and what we're doing and whether we're, you know, you, you might have come across this before, people, uh, uh, whether you're a real Christian or not, whether you're the real deal, whether, you know, uh, you really are saved or forgiven and, uh, you know, people have those opinions. Uh, but the devil has an even louder voice many times. People speak, they say what they say, uh, but one of the greatest wars that go on inside of our hearts as the saints of God, uh, inside of our minds, uh, is the whispers from the enemy. And he speaks words of condemnation. Now, how many know, listen, beloved, we are not called to be victims in the kingdom of God. You and I are not supposed to function in Christ with a victim mentality, uh, hanging our heads low, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just wallowing in self-pity, always worrying about, you know, uh, uh, what's going to happen in our lives. Jesus called us to be victors uh, in Christ. Uh, but listen to these words. One man said it like this. He said, the greatest tool or weapon that the devil has in his arsenal against the saints is not sickness, disease, persecution, famine, poverty, drugs, alcohol, or even sexual temptation. The greatest weapon that he has is condemnation. He draws met more people out of the kingdom through condemnation than all of those other things. And it's a war that many people will not say. They won't come forward and say, Pastor, I'm feeling condemned. Pastor, I can't seem to get over my past uh, pains and hurts, the things that I've done in uh, my life before I got saved. Uh, we don't come forward and say those things, but there are many of us. I've been, been around long enough to know uh, there are many of us, even in the house of God today, uh, that are wrestling with condemnation in our hearts. Jesus wants to set us free. And so the Bible says these words, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, says, What shall we say to these things then? If God is for us, amen, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Uh, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ uh, who died and furthermore is risen. Uh, who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, uh, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I want to talk to you today about guilt, shame and condemnation. Now, before I begin, I feel it's necessary to lay a bit of a foundation here because guilt and shame, as it were, are not actually bad things. I'm going to qualify what I'm about to say here. Guilt and shame is something that God uh, 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 created inside of us. See, these are emotions that God has placed inside of us for a reason. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, uh, when they had committed sin, the first thing uh, that they felt uh, was was a feeling of guilt and shame. We know this because the Bible says uh, they hid themselves from God uh, and they started trying to cover themselves up. How many know uh, when you feel guilty naturally, uh, you want to hide yourself from those who are righteous. When people are feeling guilty, uh, they often want to hide themselves from church. Uh, I'm feeling guilt. Uh, I'm feeling shame. They try and cover it up themselves. Uh, but God teaches us a lesson uh, through Adam and Eve is that the real way to restoration is repentance repentance uh, and he is able to cover and clothe uh, properly guilt and shame are necessary components when it comes to conviction and repentance without guilt and shame we wouldn't feel the need to repent We've given our lives to Jesus. We're saved and born again. Uh, and that came. I know for myself, uh, I came into the set and I came into a Bible study. Uh, and I can't even remember what the film was about that we were showing. Uh, there was a film going on. Uh, all I know is when the altar call came, uh, I felt this weight of guilt and shame about my sin and the way I was living. Uh, and my hand went up. Uh, I wanted to give my heart to Jesus. I wanted to be forgiven. Uh, and as soon as that happened, how many know there's a weight that's lifted? 
You feel that weight lifted off your shoulders. Uh, it's a wonderful feeling. If you've never experienced that, beloved, you're in the right place. Amen. You can give your heart to Jesus today. Uh, you can feel the same weight lifted off of your shoulders. Uh, but all of that was possible because there was that feeling initially of guilt and shame. How many know guilt and shame is part of owning the wrong that we've done? Guilt and shame is recognizing that I have sinned. God, I've fallen short. God, I know what I'm deserving of. But how many know we thank God for his mercy today? God created guilt and it is a good thing. It brings us to the right direction. But how many know everything that God has created good, the enemy wants to pervert for wickedness and evil. God created marriage uh, and sex within marriage uh, and within the confines of marriage. But how many know the devil wants to pervert that and twist it? And so everything that God creates good, guilt and shame, uh, a good thing that leads us to repentance, uh, brings us back into his presence. Uh, the enemy uh, wants to twist and pervert and that's what we would call condemnation today. Could you imagine a world without guilt and shame? I'm telling you, listen, the days that we're living in uh, are, are cold days. Just down in London, I know hopefully by the grace of God it's not as bad up here, but just down in London, not far from where our church is, probably 20 minutes uh, down in Croydon, there was a girl recently you might have heard in the news, I don't know if you got that news, but she was killed in broad daylight, 15-year-old girl on her way to school. Altercation, something happened, a 17-year-old boy stabs her twice in broad daylight. I'm talking about it was at 8.30 in the morning. People are passing by. Uh, this young man has no regard. Uh, he's, he doesn't even care who's watching, doesn't care about the consequences. Uh, listen, this is, this is what the Bible speaks of in the last days, uh, that people's hearts grow cold. Uh, and what we're seeing is a measure. But can you imagine if there was no guilt and no shame? People would function like that all day, every day. We'd be reading stories. Uh, people would do madness in broad daylight. There's no shame about sin. How many know guilt and shame uh, bring about a moral compass? Uh, even for those who are not saved, that feeling of, no, no, that's a shameful thing to do. Uh, I'd feel too guilty about that. Even those who are not saved, uh, guilt and shame still leads us on the right path. So feeling bad about sin is not a problem here today. How many know we're supposed to feel bad about sin? God uh, uh, hates sin. He does not like sin. He is not for sin. Our text says, uh, if God is for us, uh, who can be against us? I want to make something abundantly clear before I go any further here today. God is not for sin. But thank God today that he is for repentant sinners like you and I. That when we bow our knee, we say, God, I know I'm not perfect. God, I know my sin has created a wedge. It's created a gap between me and you. But through your son, Jesus Christ, oh God, if you can make me whole once more, I know I'm not going to get this right overnight. But God is automatic. When we do that, God is for us. Say amen today. There's the woman, the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8. And so what happens is Jesus is teaching. It's like church is going on. You can imagine Jesus is uh, around. People are asking questions. He's ministering. All these things are happening. And the Bible says these Pharisees, they bring this woman who's been caught in the very act of adultery. Now, I don't know who caught her. I don't know how these people were there. I don't know all that. The Bible doesn't give us that detail. But she, uh, they bring her before Jesus, uh, and they throw her down, uh, and they try and catch Jesus out. And they say to Jesus, uh, Moses commanded us uh, that, that, that someone like this, caught in this kind of act, should be stoned. They should be condemned uh, for their actions. Uh, and the Bible says Jesus doesn't say anything. He kneels down. He pretends like he didn't even hear them. He starts writing on the ground, the Bible says. We don't know what he writes, sir, uh, but scholars speculate he may have been writing the sins of those men. But we, we don't know what he's writing. He's writing on the ground. And so they ask him again. And he, he steps up. The Bible says he's writing again. But he steps up uh, and he says, you who's without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says from the oldest to the youngest, they walk away one by one. They drop their stones. And listen to what Jesus says to the woman. Verse 10. When Jesus has raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to a woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11. She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn. 
How many know those are good words to hear? Amen. Neither do I condemn you. Oh, he's looking at the heart of this woman. She's repentant for her actions. He said, no, no, I'm not condemning you. But many times we stop the scripture there. He then goes on to say, go and sin no more. He says, now I expect change. Now I expect transformation. Oh, you've been forgiven, yes, but don't abuse the grace of God. He says, go and sin no more. Live your life in a different direction. Don't return back to the bed of fornication. Pursue me with all of your heart. How many know when we get saved, God says, thank God he does not condemn us. Thank God that he forgives us. We're repentant, but he says, go and sin no more. I mean, God doesn't want us to live double lives. He doesn't want us one foot in the church, one foot out. He doesn't want us to be a different person out there than we are in here. Amen. If we've got all the hallelujahs and the amens in here, let us also have the hallelujahs and the amens out there. That when people see us, uh, you cross paths with someone from church. Uh, how many know you shouldn't be ducking and diving because you see someone from church? Amen. I remember when I first got saved, I was a little bit like that. You know, that, hey, listen, uh, you, I see someone from church. I'm like, oh, it's kind of embarrassing, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know how it is. Uh, but how many of you mature? It's like, no, 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 this is my life. I represent Christ. I mean, the Bible says we're not to be ashamed of the gospel. We're not to be ashamed of the good news of Jesus. Yes, I'm a Christian. I'll state it boldly. And my life out there is going to be the same as my life in here. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we can confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the problem here today isn't guilt and shame. The problem is feeling an unhealthy guilt and shame for something that Jesus has already forgiven us of. That when Jesus says you are forgiven, how many know when you come into the house of God today uh, and you sing songs about Jesus uh, and the devil tries to remind you of your past? You're lifting your hands uh, and you hear a voice and it says, how can you lift those same hands uh, with what you done all those years ago? Uh, how many know that is not our portion today? Uh, God says that is condemnation. Uh, it's under the blood. You've been forgiven. Uh, and this is what we really want to talk about today, this issue of condemnation. Our text says in verse 33, uh, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Uh, it's God who justifies, 34, who who is he who condemns? Uh, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, uh, who also makes intercession for us. What is this thing called condemnation? Well, the Greek word, I hope I don't butcher the word, is katakrima. And this means an adverse sentence. It's a verdict. It's uh, uh, not the, 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 the judgment that you want. You go to court uh, and the, the, the hammer's being dropped. Uh, it is guilty as charged. It is an adverse uh, sentence. That's what it means. And, and the Bible says that you and I are supposed to be completely free uh, from that feeling or that kind of, uh, that in, the, in our minds, that issue of condemnation here's what the bible says at the beginning of this chapter romans 8 verse 1 a scripture we know very very well there is therefore now no condemnation uh, to those who are in christ jesus uh, there is now therefore no condemnation not just some uh, not just okay this type of condom no, no there's no condemnation uh, so there is no version of events uh, there's no version of your life uh, where you are supposed to have a spirit of condemnation looming over you. I've had people in my church come to me and say, Pastor, I just feel like this is my portion, uh, that you know what, God's just judging me, uh, this is how it's always going to be, uh, I'm going to always feel bad about what I did, uh, and it's like they have this defeated victim mentality, uh, I'm just going to have this spirit of condemnation looming over, there is no version of your life in Christ Jesus uh, that he says you should have a spirit of condemnation. So there's two meanings to this word, katakrima. The first meaning is condemnation by conclusion. It's condemnation, it's to conclude, uh, this is true condemnation. And so this is condemnation that says it is final. Now listen to me, the only person that has the ability to condemn you and I by conclusion is God himself. 
And so the Bible says in our text, who is he who condemns? It is Christ. Uh, and then he goes on, who died and furthermore is written. It's only Christ who actually has the power to truly condemn us. The devil begins to speak it. He begins to voice it. He doesn't even have the power to condemn us. He's condemned himself. Uh, he doesn't have the power to condemn us. Uh, it's actually God who has the power to condemn us. Uh, but thank God that the same one who has the power to condemn is the same one the Bible says that intercedes for you and I. He's the same one that died uh, on that cross for you and I to make a way so he doesn't have to. So condemnation by conclusion. Second meaning of that word is condemnation by comparison. And this is where it gets a little bit closer to home for many of us. Uh, one man said uh, or described it like this is to show one's good conduct. Oh, sorry, to show by one's good conduct that others are guilty of misconduct and deserve condemnation. So you look at someone else and they're doing better than you. They, they, they seem to be in more church services than you. They seem to understand the scriptures better than you. Uh, uh, someone reads a scripture, they're dropping revelation and bombs. Uh, and you're like, man, uh, they preach. And you're like, wow. And it's like, oh my days. Uh, but you know, it's just another person like you and I, right? It's a, a man or a woman like you and I. Uh, and so we compare ourselves. How many know the devil's playground is comparison? The devil loves comparison. Uh, when he wants to get into the minds and the hearts of the saints, uh, all he has to do is begin to compare. You go out into the car park uh, and, you, you know, you were feeling good. Uh, uh, you just bought your first car and you're having a good time. Uh, and you're like, man, I'm going out there. You just thank God you got a car that runs. Amen. That you can go on the motorway uh, and you're not going to hear. G -g 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 -g. Trust me, I've been there many times. Uh, and so, you know, you go out in the car park. You're excited. Uh, you want to show someone your car and you say, hey, look at my new car. Everything's good until another brother in church says, oh, you got a new car. I just got a new car, too. And he opens up a brand new Mercedes E-Class. Uh, whoop, whoop. And he opens that. Uh, uh, everyone's gra uh, uh, gravitating toward that car. And all of a sudden, what you have doesn't seem as good. Everyone's excited on their wedding day. Oh, they've got all the pictures, uh, married, uh, praise God, uh, all of that. And you know how it goes. A uh, couple years into the marriage, now all of a sudden comparing your marriage uh, to another marriage in the church. How they always hold hands together. He's always buying her gifts. Uh, she loves him more and all of that. The devil's playground is comparison. If you ever want to know the power of comparison, all you have to do is consider social media. There are so many people that was secure in themselves and secure in Christ until they got social media. Now, I'm not, you know, listen, social media has its pros and cons. We've got a church account and stuff like that. I understand that we spread the gospel and all of that, but you got to be careful because all it takes is one too many hours, because people spend hours, one too many hours scrolling through, looking at what this girl has that you don't have. What this guy has that you don't have. Uh, and you begin to scroll through and all of a sudden your life seems to seem incomplete. It seems like, man, there's not enough uh, going on for me. Uh, and the lie of this is people only show you what they want to show you. People put their best foot forward. Uh, people are using filters. Uh, people are going to Turkey. Don't think we don't know about that. We know about all of that. It's not even real. And people are comparing themselves uh, to something that's fake. Uh, and they're concluding, man, why isn't God moving in my life? Uh, why does my life look so empty? Because the devil's playground is comparison. In church, you might think that there's nobody else that has issues like you have issues. Can I tell you, can I keep it real? Hey, listen, I get bad news too. I have to tell my church sometimes, it's, you think the pastor just got it all made. Uh, it's easy for you. You're the man of God and blah, blah, blah. Listen, I get problems too. I get letters through the post that I don't want to read. <laughs> you know, I have issues as well that I have to deal with. And the thing is, in church, we interact with people. They look so made up. Everything looks good. But we don't realize they've got issues just like we've got issues as well. You know, who we're supposed to compare ourselves to, biblically, is we're supposed to be comparing ourselves to Christ. Now, at first, that might seem daunting. It's like, okay, I'm not going to compare myself to another saint. I'm going to compare myself to the pinnacle of perfection in Christ Jesus. 
But you see, what that does, uh, when we look upon Christ and we compare ourselves to Christ, what it does, we know that he is God in the flesh. Uh, we know that that is God, our Lord and Savior. And so what that does to us, it creates a dependency. And so we compare ourselves to Christ and we're reminded how far we are from him and how, you know, how many times we miss the mark. And we're like, God, I need you more today than I needed you yesterday. We compare ourselves to him because he's also the answer to the gap being filled. When we compare ourselves to people, it breeds depression. When we compare ourselves to Christ, it breeds dependency in our hearts. So there is some bondage when it comes to condemnation. I want to list out a couple things here uh, that condemnation does and seeks to do in our hearts and minds. This is where the devil wants us. First of all, it blurs our perspectives on life. We have a warped view of God and of people many times because of condemnation. You've ever met those people? Don't, don't turn to them if they're in church today. Amen. Like you bust a little joke uh, and, it, you know, just a, just a lighthearted joke, nothing deep, nothing personal. Uh, and they're so sensitive. It's like they're oversensitive. It's like, whoa, okay, you learned a lesson. Uh, and you know there's certain people that you have to tread on eggshells around. Uh, hopefully not in here, but you know, out in your workplace, let's say. You have to tread on eggshells around them uh, because they're super sensitive. Uh, well, condemnation has that effect. Uh, we become, it, it, it warps our perspective. Everything becomes personal. It's like the most, just life happens. How many know bad things happen in life? It doesn't mean that God is judging you. This is one thing, this is where a lot of Christians hang. Because we know that God delights to bless his people, we then conclude that if I'm not seeing the blessing that I want to see right now in my life, it means that God's upset with me, or God is judging me, or God hates me, or I'm not saved. And that couldn't be further from the truth because how many know we have seasons in life? Yes, overall our life, uh, we want to see that, amen. We want to see the graph go like that. But really it looks more like this. It looks like ups and downs, highs and lows. Uh, over time, we see the progress, yes. Uh, but sometimes we're going to be in the valley, church. Sometimes we're going to be going uh, day by day, just calling upon God. Uh, God, would you help me through? It does not mean that he has forsaken you, church. So it blurs our perspective, condemnation seeks to. The second thing that it seeks to do is give the enemy a stronghold in our lives. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He begins to accuse. He uses condemnation as a weapon. Has anyone here been paintballing before? Paintballing. And all of it, listen, I love paintballing. Paintballing, uh, I could go every single week without fail. And, uh, you know, hey, listen, I need to find a way uh, of merging paintballing with outreach. And then it's like an every week thing. I'll be there. Amen. And so anyway, paintballing, when I go, I want to make it as real as possible. I don't want all the, you know, they give them overalls. Some people come with hoodies and stuff. Uh, no, 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 no. Let me go out in my T-shirt. I'll just take the vesting, uh, my T-shirt. I've got my stuff. Uh, and when I go out there, every single time I go paintballing, they, since I discovered it, I've never done it any other way. I always get the weapons upgrade. And so you get the weapons upgrade. Uh, and when you shoot that gun, instead of your bullet going like, you know, all over in the wind, uh, it goes straight. And so, you know, I'm not going out there to fellowship. I'm going out there for... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going up there for the real deal, amen. I want my bullets going straight. Thank God that all my disciples are always on my team, amen. But I want them bullets going straight. Give me all the grenades you've got, everything. Load me up with all the stuff. I'm going out there, like I said, not to fellowship. How many know, listen, when we entertain a spirit of condemnation, when we give in to that in our minds, what we are doing is we're handing the devil a weapons upgrade for our lives. We're handing him the best weapon that he could ever use against us. Uh, and this is why in our minds and in our hearts, we'll never see this on the surface. Yes, sometimes when it's way down the road, uh, you might see someone's life uh, and it begins to spike. But it starts in the heart and mind way before that. And listen, beloved, God wants to set us free. Uh, every single one of us, we have a greater weapons arsenal than the devil. 
in Christ, in the word of God, when we begin to declare God's word, we have got greater weapons. We've got bigger tanks. We've got bigger missiles than the enemy. And when he tries to wage war on our hearts and our souls, you and I can rise up in Christ and say, devil, I'm not standing for that. Yes, I might be in a difficult place. Yes, I might be in a bad situation right now, but my God is able to bring me through, church. You've seen those movies before where everything's looking bad until, you know what, hey, until the, the, the weapons change, until someone picks up, a, they find this new weapon and all of a sudden the tables turn. Listen, God wants you and I to discover the weapons that we have. When Jesus was being tempted by the enemy, all he kept saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. When you and I get the word of God and the promises of God in our hearts, we have the greatest weapons at our disposal. The third thing that it seeks to do is it seeks to alter our theology and our relationship with God. Condemnation seeks to drive us to want to earn our salvation. As opposed to us receiving the gift, the free gift of God, of salvation for our lives, uh, condemnation says you and I need to make up for what we have done. Condemnation says you need to earn your salvation. And so how many know ministry is a great thing? But when I, when I first got saved and I wanted to get involved in ministry, if I'm brutally honest with you, when I first got into ministry, my first thought, I wanted to do something in the church. I see people doing stuff. I wanted to get involved, not just because, oh, I love God so much, but my driving force at that time was I need to pay God back. Like God's done, and I get it, to whom much is given, much is required. I understand that element, but it was an unhealthy side of that, where I'm trying to pay God off. I'm trying to say, God, I'm going to earn this back from you. Listen, how many know there is nothing that you and I can do to ever pay for our salvation? There is nothing. If we could, we wouldn't need Jesus. Every single one of us desperately needed this, a, a, a savior to step in because there is no way on earth that you and I could pay for our salvation. But condemnation seeks to drive us in that direction. Pay for it. Earn it. And instead of being motivated by love, we serve God in fear. We serve God uh, because we feel we have to. Uh, and uh, God wants us to desire him. God wants us to love him. When we're serving and doing our nursery duties, praise and worship, whatever we're doing in the church, usher it, uh, it's because of our love for Jesus. Amen. Ultimately, what that does and what condemnation wants to bring us to is a feeling of self-righteousness. And this is a dangerous place. Because uh, what happens then is if you're earning your salvation, you, it's all about you and what you do. You start feeling that it's your righteousness that's, you know, making you holy and, and, and getting you to heaven. Uh, the problem is, is you are going to fail at some point. And when you fail and you've built this up, that it's all about you and your righteousness, uh, you're going to come crashing down. This is where many Christians, uh, they come from up here and something goes wrong and all of a sudden uh, they're spiraling out. Is God really God? Uh, you know, and all of that. And, and, and they lose. Uh, some even lost their salvation. They've kind of just uh, lost their way. Why? Because they built up this self-righteousness and it all stems back to condemnation. The ultimate destination of condemnation uh, is depression and suicidal thoughts. This is why the enemy wants to use it against the saints of God. I read an article about condemnation. I just, you know, I just got a, a, a snippet of it. A Christian article. It said, one main difference between condemnation and conviction is where they will lead you. Condemnation leads you further away from God toward death. Conviction leads you closer to God and toward life. Biblical condemnation is more than a feeling. It's a state of being that defines your relationship with God. He's talking about like when it's final. When you stand before God condemned, proper condemnation, it means your current eternal home is away from God in hell. To be condemned means you've been found guilty and have been sentenced to death listen for everyone here who's saved and born again you gave your life to jesus your eternal destination changed there is no version of your life in christ 
whereby you are supposed to have a spirit of condemnation hovering over you. God is the only one who has the power to condemn. And God says, if you meant it, you sincerely repented before him, you are forgiven. So this is what we have to learn today before we pray, is we have to learn how to forgive ourselves. You know, see, we talk a lot about forgiving other people. That person that wronged us when we were young, that person, uh, the school teacher that said some things, our parents that said some things, family members, friends. Uh, you may have had to forgive some people in church uh, and we're working through forgiveness, forgive, forgiving other people. We have to learn how to forgive ourselves, church. Uh, you know, there are things we've done in the past and I'm not saying uh, you start boasting and bragging about the things. No, there's still that element of, man, that was a bad time. But I know that God has forgiven me. I remember I'd said something as a new convert to a guy in our church uh, and, uh, you know, he was, he had been in, in Christ a little bit longer than me, but I said something that was a little bit harsh and I was a new convert and me and my friends used to talk a certain way and I said something and, uh, you know, it, it was bad. But then I, I, I apologized to him and everything like that and we moved on and, and, you know, we even started living together at one point and everything. And I remember further down the road, months, maybe, maybe a year later, he left church abruptly. And for some reason, in my mind, it was because of what I'd said to him. And so, you know, in my head, I'm like, man, maybe if I didn't say that to him. And I'm talking about a passing comment that, yes, it was like, you know, a little bit offensive and stuff like that. But we went on. We had we'd done music together and all of that. But how many of the devil can do that sometimes? Is that you've done one thing and he magnifies this thing and it's all your fault. And I had to bring that before God and God had to help me. Yeah? And, of course, forgive myself. God set me free. But, beloved, there are people here today. Yeah? You're thinking about some of the things you've done in the past. Yeah? And it's like, man, my life yeah, is where it is because I did X, Y, Z. Yeah? How many know that? in Christ uh, all things have become new uh, all things have passed away he says uh, behold all things have become new so let's lastly look at conquering and then we're going to pray our text says in verse 37 yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us conquering is a term of war bible the bible doesn't say uh, you know, we're managers, right? That we're supposed to manage our condemnation. He doesn't say uh, that, you know, we just deal with it or we get on with it or we just uh, ignore it. No, he says conquer it. He says you are to overcome as in uh, this is warfare. There has to be one victor at the end of the day. I mean, oh, someone's got to wave that flag of surrender. And when it comes to condemnation, every time uh, you and I have the equipment uh, to force the devil into surrender in our lives. Uh, you and I can begin to draw on the word of God. Uh, there are some things that we need to do. A couple things. First thing we need to do uh, is we must get vocal about it. We have to get vocal about warfare against condemnation. We have to speak God's word and God's promises uh, to those who are in Christ. Uh, our text in the very beginning of this chapter says, uh, There is therefore now no condemnation uh, to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, this, this chapter begins the same way it ends, uh, which is saying that you and I, our portion is not uh, condemnation. You have to learn how to verbalize God's promises uh, for your life. Uh, when things are difficult, when the enemy's trying to assault, you have to speak it out. You, you can't just, uh, it's not enough to have heard a sermon about it. It's not enough, oh yeah, Pastor Courtney preached on that a few weeks ago uh, and now I'm feeling condemned. No, you need this in your heart. Uh, you need to be able to speak this out when things begin to happen. Uh, listen to some of the promises of God here. Micah chapter 7 verse 19. Uh, he will again have compassion on us uh, and will subdue our iniquities. Uh, you will cast our sins into the depths uh, of the sea. Jeremiah 31 verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying no the Lord they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more Hebrews 8 verse 12 for I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more listen his promise constantly he says when you are forgiven God says he will remember no more it's not that oh it, you know he just uh, uh, can't remember who you were before he chooses uh, to erase this from his memory 
family. He chooses uh, not to hold you accountable to that. He chooses, uh, instead of putting the judgment on us, uh, we are atoned through the judgment that was placed on Jesus Christ. Uh, Psalm 103 verse 10 uh, to 12 says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, uh, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Uh, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. See, when we're feeling condemned, the devil will do everything he can to keep us from remembering those scriptures. But I tell you something, if you would lock those away in your heart, when you start feeling that feeling uh, and things are going on in your mind, you begin to recite that as it is written, uh, as it is written, I'm telling you, you begin to conquer the spirit of condemnation. One man said, I like this, he said, uh, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Uh, when, they, when he try to remind you of your past, you tell him where he's about to he end up. You read the book of Revelation. Oh yeah, yeah, Satan and uh, all of Hades are poured out into the lake. You remind him, hey, listen, I'm not the one that's condemned here. You're the one that's condemned. The second thing that you need to do to help overcome. Yes, you speak it out. You've got to get vocal about it. But the second thing is look at the fruit of your life. I've had people come to me in my church with a spirit of condemnation. And I'm like, look at what God is doing through your life. Just pause for a second. Look how many young men and young women are gravitating towards you. You're helping them. You're encouraging them. They're doing better in the Lord uh, simply because you're there helping them and all that. Listen, Jesus said a bad tree can't bear bad fruit. A good tree can't, uh, sorry, a, 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 bad, a good tree can't bear bad. You know what I'm saying anyway. And so Jesus said that. And so I'm like, look at the fruit of your life. That's an encouragement. As you see, oh, there are good things flowing from my life. Growth, uh, people are being helped and touched. Uh, good things are flowing from my life. Surely I'm not condemned. And then the third thing and final is we've got to learn how to call upon Christ because our text says uh, he is the one who fights for us. We want to conquer. Listen, I know there's things we do in our own strength, but ultimately it's Christ who wins the war. Verse 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also ris risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He stands in the gap for you and I. That when we are at our lowest point, we call upon Jesus uh, and he stands in the gap. He is the one who intercedes. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'll close with this. There's, we, we, we went uh, to Jamaica uh, at the beginning of the year, early on in the year, and we sent an impact team over to Jamaica. Good time. You know, we went out there and, and started off. It's a new church uh, and not many people there. And so we just seen visitors come through to the revival. And so Monday night, I had some flyers in my hand and I went outside church just before we're going to start praise and worship. And so I'm stood outside church. There's a, a road up uh, I wouldn't say a main road, it's like off of a main road. So there's people going by, you know, going home and stuff. So I'm handing them some flies. Hey, do you want to come out? Maybe not tonight, tomorrow night, Wednesday, all that. I'm, I'm encouraging them. As I'm doing this, there's a woman sat across the road, no further than from here to the back of the church, right? So it's just a road and she sat over there on the other side. Her house is right there. She sat on a chair outside. She's smoking her and she's kind of rocking on her chair. And you know, she's watching what I'm doing. So as I'm doing my thing, I see her, she keeps watching her and stuff. And so I'm like, you know what, let me go over and speak to her. Let me go and invite her. And so I walk over and uh, you know, I start speaking to her, talking to her about Jesus and everything. And, and uh, you know, she, 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 when I got close, I realized she wasn't smoking a cigarette. And so I was like, hey, I got to preach in a second. I can't get too close. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be wobbling. You know, this is middle of Jamaica. And so I'm like, hey, I don't want to be wobbling. <laughs> so anyway, I'm speaking to her and I'm encouraging her about Christ. I said, I gave her a fly. I said, why don't you come to church? Why don't you come? said, you know the church is just there. She said, yeah, I see the church all the time. I live here. And so I'm like, why don't you come? Have you ever been inside the church? And so she kind of looked at herself. She kind of looked at the, oh, I'll say the cigarette. <laughs> she looked at the cigarette and she looked at herself. Uh, and she just looked at her house, looked at her clothes. Uh, and she said, she said to me, she looked at me, she said, I, I don't think it's for me. And I said, no, 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 you've got this all wrong. 
this is exactly for you. This is, this is the exact kind of person that we need to come into the house of God. And so I, I'm encouraging her. I said, look, I've got to go in. Because praise and worship is about to start. Here's the flyer. I want you to come. And so I left it at that. She's kind of umming and ahhing. I go inside. Uh, praise and worship's on. We have a good time. I start preaching. As I'm preaching, she walks in through the back of the church. She had changed her clothes uh, and she's kind of walking in very sheepishly, like kind of, and so, you know, someone welcomed her in the door, sits her down at the back and she hears the sermon. The end of the service, lo and behold, do the altar call. She puts her hand up, she gets saved. Amen, praise God. And so she gets saved. That was the Monday night. Every night of the revival, she came back. She's bringing people out. But think about this. For about six months, she's seen the church there. But what stopped her from walking in was this feeling of, nah, I'm not worthy. Ah, you know, How many know she's in a hopeless situation? And across the road is a center of hope. But the devil had her sitting out there just watching from a distance. How many know God doesn't want any of us to miss what God has for us because of a spirit of condemnation? God's got so much more for you. If you'd only just begin to say, you know what? I am no longer standing for this. I'm not going to let the devil hold me bound. Jesus has an answer. Amen. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me.